Hey folks, welcome back to The Build. We're doing well. We're halfway through our second week and hopefully, hopefully it's gonna be livable by the end of this week. We're doing extractors today. More on the fancy one in a minute. First up, let's do the straightforward bit, I hope, which is gonna to be to get the hood installed above our hob. So the first job of the day for me was to get this hob extractor up on the wall. Fairly straightforward project, fortunately. It's a basic model, a Cook and Lewis uh, extractor from B&Q, and no doubt you'll find similar ones to this under different names online. It's gonna be used uh, initially under a recirculation, so all we're worried about at the moment is just grease, oil, smells, things like that. And we'll de deal with the extraction elsewhere. But we'll talk about that later on in the video. For now, we just need to get this up on the wall, installed and working. Well, we haven't decided quite what we're doing, extraction or recirculation or anything yet. The other extract is just to the right. But for now, that's what it would look like if we did. And we could mitre it into the ceiling to carry on the slope. So there's two more screws in the back here, somewhere. Oh, I need a, I need a dinky little 12 volt screwdriver, because that ain't gonna. Solid. So if you want to, and we want to do a recirculation setup, then you just slide the charcoal filter in here and here. It's a normal motor setup. And then of course, if we want to send it straight out through the exhaust, then we'll put some ducting up and elbow it through. That's obviously one option, but like I said in a previous video, we've got another extractor going up here, which is my job next. What it might be that we do is get this one fired up with a couple of, you know, they're not expensive, are they? Get those charcoal filters in and then do that and then we can make a decision afterwards. The other fan will pick up on an increase in humidity and things and if we find that that's kicking in or if it's saying that the humidity is high, we will probably put an exhaust on this. Right, I promise you an extravagant extractor van. That's what you're getting. First up, I need to explain why we need particular fans and ventilation in this building. If you haven't been following this build right from the beginning, let me give you a bit of background. This is a cabin. It's built on two chassis and it's relatively high performance for what it is. It's certainly no caravan by nature, even if it is by name. And for that reason, we've done our best to insulate the walls. Uh, we've, in this case, we've done it breathable. We've got um, sheep's wool there and wood fiber boards, and that is providing a decent amount of insulation for the thickness. Our floor is very well insulated. We've got 200 mil of mineral wool there. And our ceiling, there's two halves to it. One is PIR insulation up here. Again, 125 mil there. And then as we move into the flat roof section, which is down this end, these are trust roofs and they've got three or 400 mils of insulation in there. But more importantly than that, it's not just about insulation. 
It's also about airtightness and draft proofing. It's no good having a super insulated house if there's leaky seams and gaps and holes everywhere. So we have OSB clad on the whole internal surface on the whole of the inside. Behind this plasterboard, behind any cladding, the OSB is there. That is taped as well. OSB is relatively airtight, so we're happy there. Uh, and then the ceiling is either taped foil or it's a big vapor barrier underneath all the flat ceilings. So we're pretty good as far as air tightness goes. We haven't done a blower test and we don't really intend to, but we know that it's airtight in here uh, enough for performance reasons anyway. We've also taped all the way around our windows using special airtight breathable tapes in this case on both the outside and the inside. They're taped to our frames, which are then taped to our wall structure which is taped to our OSB, you get the idea. Now, because we have insulated with natural fibers in our walls, we haven't really got the same sort of condensation risks there, but elsewhere we would have. And in the last few weeks when it was colder, this one little bit of exposed vapor barrier up here, right at the top, whereas the weather isn't quite as much insulation, we would get some beads forming there. Perfect, it's on the right side of the vapor barrier, it's not forming inside our insulation, but that is an indication that between that and maybe the inside of panes of glass and the door and things like that, we could end up with moisture condensing on our walls, just like you would have in an old house. So extraction and ventilation is really important, especially in a well-sealed airtight house like this. But if you're in an old house and you might have colder walls and you might have a bit of natural ventilation coming through by the means of drafts through the building, you still might end up with condensation, damp, mold, and all the nasties that come with that. But you can just as well have it in a modern, a brand new house if it's not ventilated well. So in an old house, you might have trickle vents or you might just have leaky windows or something like that. In a more modern house, you need to think about ventilation and how it's gonna be done. And there are lots of methods, but MVHR is one route that we want to go in the future with the main build. And we're kind of looking at how that works with us here. So MVHR, what does it stand for? Well, it's mechanical ventilation with heat recovery. That's the HR. So mechanical ventilation just basically means air being blown in or out by means of a fan. So it could be uh, an, an extractor fan. It could be uh, that you simply have um, a fan blowing fresh air into the building. But in this case, it's got the heat recovery uh, element to it. So if we just had a big extractor fan up here, a bit like a bathroom extractor or a nice powerful um, kitchen extractor fan, you're basically heating your house with all your radiators, your wood burner, underfloor heating, whatever it might be, and then you're sucking it straight out of the house. And that's not really that great as far as you're paying normally to create all this heat and you're wasting it out of the room if it's cold and you want that to stay in. Um, but also, you might find that you are pulling cold air in from elsewhere. So if you've got leaky doors and drafts else elsewhere, and you're pulling air through, then actually you're pulling warm air out, and behind it is you're pulling cold air in. So that's no good. The other option that some people do is they blow air into a house, and you might have that up in your loft or whatever, and it's, it's bringing in fresh filtered air. And if you've got a leaky house then your stale other air will go out. But it's very uncontrolled because you're relying on leaks in your house. So we've done this build in a way that hopefully there aren't too many leaks. Therefore, we want to put a fan up here that is going to be taking out all of the stale warm air in the house, but we don't want to lose the heat. So what it does, it's going to take that out, but it's also going to bring in fresh air and preheat that using the heat that was going to be wasted and bring it back in. So we're kind of getting rid of the actual air from in the building, but not the heat. So in a bigger build, one with a bit more engineering behind it and a bit more planning, you, we would have, and most people would, use a central MVHR unit. Normally sits up in your loft, great big box, and that is gonna do all the work for you. So it's gonna have a, a duct running to every room in the house, and it's gonna have an exhaust duct. So it's taking all that warm, stale air out of all the rooms. So it might be in your kitchen where it's warm and moist. It might be in your bathrooms. Again, nice kind of warm air, but also very damp. So you want to get rid of it. So it's sucking all those um, rooms of air out. And when it gets to the box, then it's taking the heat from that. It's like a plate, maybe a heat exchanger of some sort. And the warm air runs past it, heats it up. And at the same time, you've got fresh air coming in and another fan which is filtered 
and then that heat transfers to it. And then every room also has an inlet, so it's got fresh air being blown back into the room very, very gently. This is kind of higher volumes, but quite low pressure, I guess, so it's silent most of the time. So you end up with a really even temperature around the house and also your warm patches that might be your kitchens, your bathrooms, that warmth gets shared around the house. So you might have a wood burner in a snug the other end of the house, but actually in some way that that's actually heating the whole house through these ventilation units. So you might like the idea of MBHR, but you haven't got the ability to start cutting in and running big duct work around your house. And you might already have a house that's built so you're not in the design phase where you can incorporate it so there is an option still and that's what we've ended up buying for this building which is a decentralized mbhr which is essentially just a fan that goes in the wall and it works in a little bit of a different way but it same concept now i think i found two brands that did a, a decentralized mbhr that means you don't have the big box in the roof you don't have the ducting everywhere you just have a fan on the wall which is doing the same sort of thing there was one, I think it was Blauberg, I'll put it on the screen. They do uh, bigger systems as well, but their units are best done in pairs, I think. So one blows in and one sucks out and then they swap over and they're kind of connected. I thought that was a good idea, but we only really wanted to install one to start with. The other one we will do in coming weeks. Um, but I, fa I found this on some forum. Um, someone had suggested it as a good option. So this... I think the company's Prana. Um, I think they're made in Ukraine, actually. Uh, but by all the reading and research I've done, it sounds like this is a great option for us, and it's a really slick install, I hope. <laughs> now, I must say, this is not a sponsored video, and in actual fact, I didn't find the customer services and the sales and everything to be very good at all. Um, not great communications. It's also the importer or the dealer in the UK is working from a domestic address and, uh, you know, everything has to be done by backs. It all was, we were a bit nervous, but it, it's okay. It is a legitimate setup. It's just, there's not like a big team in the UK. So bear that in mind um, if you're ordering. But I think when, sometimes when, when it's such a specific product, you really don't get left with too many options. So I, I'm not sure where they're based, but they are big in Europe. And I know for a fact that um, people are putting, uh, and companies and flats and things are putting lots of these in, uh, you know, every room. So if you're a landlord or something and there's problems with condensation or air quality or whatever it might be, then it probably pays to put one of these in every room or every flat rather than dealing with constant issues because moisture and condensation and it, it can make you pretty poorly and it's not a um not something we don't take in lightly anyway you're seeing this as i see it hermetically closed do not turn on the fans start up pull to open first impressions not the best wiring they're all a bit frayed and uh, not tinned or crimped or anything on the end there from an install perspective Nothing's jumping out at me at being very tricky because that is as simple as it gets, live and neutral. And then this is our visible surface on the inside of the wall. And they have two sizes. Bizarrely, when you look at the specs, there's the 150, which is this, and a 300 something, yet all the spec is exactly the same. And I don't know if that's an error or why you would go for the bigger unit but the bigger unit is same liters a minute or cubic meters an hour or whatever it might be. Everything seemed to be almost identical. So I guess that's the point of our wall. So it's fairly simple on the inside. And then that is the outside. Now the email information was a little bit limited, uh, like I said, and from what I gathered, we are not able to cut this down quite obviously, I don't think. Um, therefore, we have to bring our wall depth and thickness out to accommodate for this. So um, in our case, I think our wall is about 175 here. It means on the outside, I need to create a little sort of timber box within our cladding, and this will stick out of that. 
rather than flush with the cladding. Which isn't ideal, but I guess these are made for a standard size thickness wall, which even that looks, yeah, I guess the cavity wall is probably about that. So in here I can see the fan code. In there, that little label there, the, <laughs> the model of it is called Good Quality DC Fan. So, uh, don't know if that's reassuring or not. But Wait till I tell you the price of this as well. No instructions in there. Oh, what's this? Oh, okay. So, some A4 printouts. We get a remote. Some neatly folded instructions. So, quick users guide. Technical passport. Don't put it right next to your bed. We're going to see how noisy this one is. Because it goes into night mode and things like that. Um, because we do want to put one down the other end to supply the bedrooms. Okay. Let's see what we've bought for our money then. Uh, there is a right way and a wrong way up. You can see here that hole. That is the condensate on the bottom. These are horizontal fins. So that is where it's going to go. Right, before I give you the eye-watering total of how much this cost, um, I'll explain how it works. So instead of having stale and fresh air running around in ducts, this obviously is just one duct that runs through the wall. So what happens is, from what I gather, there's a fan this end, and there's a fan this end. In actual fact, it's a good quality fan. Uh, so one's blowing that way, one's blowing that way. It's going to be exhausting air from our building out and that will be triggered by VOC levels, humidity, uh, temperature, whatever we set it to. And there's an app, I think. So it's going to be sending that warm, moist air out of the building and be gone with you. But it's going to be recovering the heat. So 85% of heat or whatever it is, is going to go into all the copper fins. So in here, there's like a copper plate heat exchanger. So it's going to be blowing out, warming up that copper plate. This fan will gear up and it will start sucking in air from outside through the filter. And then it's going to blow it through, pick up on all that heat that was put in there or, or taken on by the copper and then blown into our room. So it's kind of like an all-in-one MVHR. And now I get to tell you how much it was. I can't even remember the exact figure. But it wasn't a million miles off a thousand pounds. I think it was 800 and something, and I can't remember if that was before or after that. But I'm hoping for that money that we're going to have decent air quality throughout the build now, so the building. This actually will cope with over, well over half of the whole house. Um, and obviously, at the moment, everything is pretty open and unlinked. Uh, in the future, we'll have the other end of the building all controlled by another one of these. Um, or, you know, if this doesn't work out, then we'll maybe try a different model down that end. But it will kick in. It will kick in with humidity. Uh, if that gets too high, uh, carbon monoxide, VOC. So it really is quite high tech as far as what it's going to detect in the building and then go on to, to get rid of that if it needs to. It, I think it's got a preheat module, which basically means if it's colder outside than inside, which is normal, uh, but if it's particularly cold outside, we can allow this to basically preheat the air as it comes in. Not like a, a proper heater, um, but it will bump it up by two or three degrees, I think I read. So that just means that you're not bringing really crisp, freezing cold air in uh, during the winter. But there we go. Let's drill a hole, make a big mess of our wall and see what it looks like. Okay, so we're going to fit up here somewhere. Um, we know that minimum is 100 mil down from the ceiling and because we've got an angled ceiling anyway, uh, we can go pretty much close to that 100. We've got a batten about here and here, which means I can fish in that void, I can fish cables down um, to where the sockets are and put a few spur down there. And I'll get James to put that in, probably down below the counter in the cupboard. It's the sort of thing we don't want to be flicked on and off too often uh, by accident. So if we put it down there, the cable will come up here. It's only got like a tiny little flex on it. So I'm sure he can extend that down somehow. Oh, that is a big old hole saw. So it says we need it to be 160 mil. This is a 152. But I don't have 
uh, anything bigger than this and I think we can just open it up a little bit. It's not like we're drilling through masonry, we've only got one shot. If I need to, then I can just use a jigsaw and open up the hole a bit. I'm gonna go ahead and drill, I'm not gonna try a vacuum. So the first bit's easy, because that's just plasterboard. I wanna go slower. God, Bennett. Right, that's one thing done. Right, so it's the next one we want to be careful with. We want to just get through the OSB and not tangle up in the sheep's wool. And we're fine on buttons. <laughs> It only takes the tiny tip of the drill and you pull all the sheep's wool in. Then we're going to use the same hole saw into the wood fibre board, which is the external insulation. This pilot will then make our nice line ex uh, hole exactly in the centre of this hole. I can't get all the way through with the drill and this bit without a load of extensions and then even then this would be too shallow for our external insulation. So I use a second bit, just a simple bit, through the center, all the way through our external membrane, and then I'll come in with this saw from the outside. So, keep it relatively level. It's windy out there. So, that's all done. Hopefully I can push it through now. Let's tear out. Oh, I'll pull her through this way. Oh, I'll tell you what, that's quite nippy out there. So I need to rearrange all this sheets for, make sure we're nicely insulated all the way around that, tear the hole a little bit, and then see if this will fit through. I've offered it up, it doesn't fit all the way through as, as we knew, so I've now marked on with a pencil. I started going and at it with a plasterboard saw, but I've got the OSB behind it, just wouldn't cut very well. Um, I don't want to damage my paintwork, so I'm going to try carefully with a, uh, the jigsaw and a sheet of paper. Probably the instruction manual. Put a bit of red tape around there just to take the edge off the OSB. Probably won't help, but go on. It's better than it was. Hey, it's in. So it needs to go up a little bit at the back, but we've definitely got an angle on it now. Yeah. So, but the other option is they could have just supplied a collar, like you would get on a flu. Yeah, because yeah, it's already a big unit, like you're not gonna, by giving you 20 mil more, you're not... Maybe they're trying to make it look super simple. Though. Yeah, they could have just made this housing a little bit bigger. Yeah, it's yeah. Big. But they're trying to, they try and skimp us, like, they do it in loads of things, they try and make them as small as they can, but you don't need to, you've already got... 150 mil yeah. unit on the wall. So I just have to fill that little nip. Right. Yeah. So anyway, think of. Right, so the unit is now going in. James has just put a few spur down under the cabinets and we're going to be able to get it in flush. I was assuming we'd have to have a switch here, but being that it won't have to be turned on and off that often, it makes sense for it to be down there so it's not accidentally turned off. The idea is it stays on 
most of the time. Uh, and it's got different overrides and things like that. So permanent power supply to it. We're just looking at how it fits to the wall. It's not the best design. It, it, it's very hard to hide the hole. Normally you'd have oversized slightly to cover your cutout. Um, of course we can seal around it, but even where the little cable goes through, there's no, e either a notch within this design to allow the cable to go up or perhaps just a little bit of a thicker collar. But anyway, it's in. There you have it, both fans are installed now. We've left this one on a recirculation mode as I suggested earlier in this video. And we're two weeks on now and I must say that the MBHR unit has been doing a great job. So I know we did a bit of a deep dive on the science of MBHR and ventilation and condensation and all those things. But hopefully there was something in this that was quite interesting in some way, shape or form. If you've got mold or condensation issues or vapor issues um, that are you know, showing themselves in bad ways in your house, then maybe something like this could be the answer. But remember, this is not the only answer, just good ventilation, opening windows, not drawing clothes inside, extraction in bathrooms and kitchens, all those things will reduce the moisture in the air, which reduces your risk of condensation, which reduces your chance of mold and all those nasties. But if you are going for a higher performance build, something that's a bit more airtight, well insulated, then you definitely need some sort of ventilation system and one of these decentralized ventilation systems is a really good way to go, especially in a retrofit or in a simple build like this. I hope you enjoyed it, but there we go. I'm going to leave it there. Thank you for watching. Remember, if you can, do it yourself and we'll see you next time.